You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode number 72 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. This week, I'm grateful to be sharing a recording from a workshop at last weekend's Serenity on the Sound Retreat, and the actual recording used was from an SAA event in Edinburgh, Scotland earlier this year with Jeannie O., talking about the history of SAA and the importance of continuing the message of recovery. In case her name sounds familiar, Jeannie was featured on episode number 27 of this podcast and was the first woman to be a part of the SAA Fellowship. At the retreat this past weekend, we listened to her recording and had time for discussion afterwards. I really enjoyed her talk and asked for permission to share it here on the podcast. And as a matter of fact, I have a few other recordings from this Serenity on the Sound retreat to share on upcoming episodes of the podcast, as well as a few guests that I met during the weekend, and more on that later. So as a part of Jeannie's share, she talked a lot about sponsorship in SAA, and especially around women's recovery. In line with that, I wanted to share a reading from the Green Book on sponsorship, and this comes from pages 13 and 14, and I'll be reading the first paragraph under the section called Sponsorship. One of the most vital aspects of the program is sponsorship. A sponsor is a person in the fellowship who acts as a guide to working the program of SAA, a fellow addict that we can rely upon for support. Ideally, a sponsor is abstinent from addictive sexual behavior, has worked the steps, and can teach us what he or she has learned from working the program. We can learn from a sponsor's experience, struggles, successes, and mistakes. Our sponsor can help explain program fundamentals, such as how to define our sexual sobriety. And most importantly, sponsors guide us through the 12 steps. And skipping to the last paragraph in this section, which can be found on page 14. Once we have worked the SAA program ourselves, gained abstinence from the sexual behaviors that were addictive for us, and experienced some degree of spiritual growth, we are ready to consider sponsoring other members who ask us to do so. SAA has no formal requirements regarding this decision. Most of us know that we are ready to sponsor when another member asks us, or when our own sponsor encourages us to take on a sponsee. We don't need to be experts about life or even about addiction in order to sponsor someone. We simply share the knowledge and experience we have gained from working the 12 steps and using the tools of the program, and we pass on the wisdom we've learned from our own sponsor and others in the fellowship. We are not responsible for the decision of our sponsees or for how well they progress in recovery. All we need to do is be ourselves and share what we have, knowing that a higher power will take care of the outcome. Such a great reading on sponsorship. And I hope to be sharing more about sponsorship on future episodes. Before getting to the recording, Jeannie mentions Christine C. and her partner Frank, who were featured on episode 66 of the podcast. And I believe this recording comes from the Sponsors Helping Sponsors podcast recordings, which Christine helps curate. Hopefully I can get permission to share some of those recordings here on this podcast. With all that being said, I'm now ready to hand it over to Jeannie in Edinburgh, talking about SAA history, helping women in the program, and carrying the SAA message to newer generations through sponsorship and service. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. Well, my name is Jeannie, and I'm a sex addict. Hi, Jeannie. It's good to be landed and 
it's especially good to be in a place where I can share that identity, which means so much to me, among my clients folk here. I've been in various toast of programs since 1977, the summer Elvis died. And um, in that time, I've learned a lot of healthy habits. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I find that I have a healthy habit that I practice at the wrong time. I wanted to share one with you. And um, in America, we have Thanksgiving, which is a chaotic feast chaotic in that all kinds of dishes flow in one direction until some relative thinks that it's good to try the opposite direction. And so food is going from the left to the right and from the right to the left. And I was at such a gathering with a large family and I saw my niece's rolls in a basket headed in my direction. And I looked away for a while and then all of a sudden it came to me and there was all the rolls were gone and I was faced with an empty bread basket. And then this ancient habit from my years in the program kicked in and I did what I often do in the presence of an empty bread basket. I reached in my pocket and put in a couple of dollars and passed it on to my relatives. <laughs> and uh, at which point my grandnephew of 10 year old says, I think it's free today. <laughs> at any rate, there's lots of silliness in the process of recovery and, and I, I cherish that. I have a a coin, a medallion with this date stamped on it. And I look at that date and I think that in reality, it's just a, a road mark. And it kind of reminds me of what we had in America, and I'm sure you had the counterpart here in Scotland of the Pony Express, you know, where carrying the mail would go by stagecoach as far as it could go, and where the populations thinned out and the distances between cities increased, it was necessary for an individual on a single horse to carry the message to the next town. And when his horse wore out, he got a fresh horse. And when he wore out, he got a fresh rider, but the message went on. And that's the way it is in recovery, is that we carry the message from coast to coast, continent to continent. And some of the messages our own story of recovery in that bag, and some of it predates our recovery. Some of it predates the creation of, of the 12 steps as well. You know, not all the stories in the, in the stories that we carry are stories of hope, but some of them are, and not all stories are stories of tragedy, but there are those stories as well. And what I wanted to talk to you about today, but I have to stop myself and I wanted to greet um, my friend, Christine in America, who was up at 4.30 in the morning watching this and, <laughs> and, and also Frank, so hats off to them. What I wanted to talk to about today is um, about carrying the message and do a, a quick review of how, how it was with carrying the message of addiction and recovery, how it is now, and what's next, because you represent what's next. As a Pony Express writer, I'm 76 years old next in two months, and so I'm I'm wearing out on my horse. And um, so the next carrier is one of you or all of you or people that we don't know yet. So that's why I'm speaking to you. Uh, when I talk about carrying the message, a lot of us think automatically of, of Bill W. But uh, the story goes before Bill W. Um, there's a DNA, so to speak, in a recovery program. There's a DNA to addiction um, in that it goes back several generations of, of humans looking at it cultures looking at it and trying to deal with it. Uh, speaking of DNA, I was in Minneapolis and a line and there's this woman who was carrying a, a cute little mutt and um, one person in the line was insisting that that was a rat terrier. Another person was insisting that that was a chihuahua. And the owner of the dog said, you know, it's kind of funny. I had an extra hundred dollars and so I had a DNA done on my dog. And going back three generations of this dog's history, there were 17 varieties of 
of dogs that went into the parentage of this puppy. And the man said, but it was a rat terrier. And the woman said, one percent of it is rat terrier. <laughs> and uh, I think that SAA, when it looks at its own genealogy, its own DNA, will recognize that it predates AA and it predates what we would consider um, 12 step fellowships or spiritual fellowships, and it extends into a wider realm. And in, in preparing for these remarks, I was I was uh, struck by a, a, an odd coincidence. And that's that one of my sources of understanding of recovery comes from a native son of, of Edinburgh, who was born at number eight Howard Place near Royal Botanical Garden, possibly walking distance from here. I have no idea where I am, so I'm assuming it is. Um, and that is Robert Louis Stevenson, who was born in 1850 and only lived 41 years, died in 1891. And in 1880, he wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And if those of you ever read it in light of your own recovery, you will recognize a metaphor that is so profound with regard to addiction. Dr. Jekyll starts out as the kindly person who wants to do good, only he wants to be more than himself. And so he reverts to something outside of himself for power. And that power makes him glow brighter, burn brighter for a while until there is a split between him and that power. And both of them set about to destroy the other. That is a story of addiction. And Robert Louis Stevenson, your native son here, did not live long enough to hear about the story of recovery. He died in 1891 and maybe a few years later saw the birth of, of Bill W. and uh, Dr. Bob, who were roughly contemporaries, and Bill W.'s wife, Lois, who in the 30s came up with the next step in that story, and that is not only is there this duality within the human personality, but there's also a hope of bringing them back together again, not killing that Dr. Jekyll, not killing Mr. Hyde, but integrating the two to one and using the force of that tragedy to make the, the original spirit stronger. And that's called the 12 steps. Now, when I look at the story of Dr. Bob and Bill W. and read the big book, I realize that it was a story of recovery essentially for white men at the time, not because of discrimination, but because of lack of vision, lack of imagination. Um, it was the uh, challenge that that group faced, AA first faced, when a black man wanted to recover in New York City, that they had to think that, well, we have the 12 steps. There might be more in this than that they had to come up with the 12 traditions, how the group was to stay sober, how the group was to grow, how the group was to recover and, and uh, maintain its, its vitality, its um, humanity and that the only purpose was to help the one who is still suffering. And that that black man in New York City did not have to have a group of his own to recover. He was legitimately a member by virtue of being an alcoholic. The same had to be um, discovered by them that alcohol referred to women too. This was kind of like a scandalous insight on their part. Um, just, that wasn't that long before I was born. But um, that was the story of, of AA's contribution of carrying the message. Um, and the next challenge for them was to say, this is a good thing we've got going. We can do this well, and we can do it swiftly, you know, as far as mounting the effort against alcohol addiction. 
But there are the other forces challenging them. And those other forces were the Narcotics Anonymous people, the Gamblers Anonymous people, and the Overeaters Anonymous people in the 40s and the early 50s. And the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous had to dis decide whether going faster was better than going farther. And they opted to go farther in their recovery efforts. And to their surprise, a number of their members were also uh, qualified for other programs. I know we find that very unastonishing now, but in order to deal with one addiction, it was, impo it was impossible unless one also addressed the other addictions present. And that was the message that was carried in the 1950s. Um, in the 1960s, there are other forces, other DNA, DNA forces that were operating in, in, um, in, the, in what would become us, you know, sort of our grandparents, so to speak. We're still a twinkle in, in their eyes. Um, and those are forces such as therapy. When uh, people were dealing with family systems by the co-addiction part of, of all of those fellowships, and addiction itself, they realized that there was a woundedness often present in the background that needed to be addressed in order to reinforce the recovery that could happen. And it was uh, in the state of emerging in the 60s. It wasn't just strictly Freudian theory, but there were other forces entering. One of those forces were Carl Jung. Um, force, and Carl Jung had a contribution um, several decades earlier to Bill W's formulation of, of the 12 steps. Um, one of Bill W's friends, Ebby, had gone to Zurich and talked with Carl Jung. And this was before the steps were written. And what this, they had as sort of like the fetal part of this 12 steps was a notion that uh, you should be able to just um, by your own bootstraps, pull yourself up. And Carl Jung's contribution, which is a contribution of, of a therapist of his mindset, was that in Carl Jung's experience, he had never seen anybody have a spiritual recovery that did not involve some source outside of himself. In other words, the nation, notion of higher power comes from Switzerland, from a non-addict. You know, and other uh, wisdoms in the DNA of SAA came from therapy and therapists who were dealing with the population that were our counterparts back then. Um, also in the 60s, uh, the forces that made it possible for SAA to emerge, because in the 60s, I don't think uh, Sex Addicts Anonymous or any of the S fellowships would have gotten off the ground, were different um, social forces begun in America, from my perspective, by the civil rights movement, which grew into the women's rights movement and grew into the gay rights movement. That those forces of liberation were necessarily pre predecessors to the evolution of the 12-step fellowship that affects you today. That's part of your DNA is the work and the message that was carried by Martin Luther King, Bella Absuk, and all the, all the rest. I'm not fluent enough to, to dictate all those names right now. Um, in the 1970s, there was a, uh, I would say that it was pretty wild and crazy in the 1970s in that, um, there was liberation without any kind of temperance. And it's not that there was no moral fiber in the 1970s, it's just that the moral fiber was polyester. And uh, as such, it had uh, quite a con contribution to make towards the founders of our own fellowship of SAA, um, the four men in Minneapolis, who are experiencing that kind of chaos with sex addiction so, and permission, 
that kind of tragedy carried to them the message of their own addiction and the special nature of it being sex addiction. And that was correspondingly happening in Boston the same summer of 1977 with um, SLAA and those two who started that. So that was the background of the formation of SAA early on. And um, what happened subsequently, the contributions of SAA were the, so the structure, the intergroup structure that helped organize and um, set up meetings first locally in Minneapolis for, for our group and then um, and, and increasing circles outward. Um, the start of women's groups, intergroup. Uh, we had no literature that was particular to SAA. We, I did, did not use the big book. What we did is we wrote our own literature. Um, we started out on weekends. We'd have meetings and on Saturdays, we'd have literature workshops where we wrote literature, where we put together starter groups for uh, starter packets for groups in North Dakota, in Los Angeles, in North Carolina. We wrote our own stuff on what was called a Xerox machine, which was um, probably can carcinogenic, I think, and you know, pretty awful purple stuff. And we took things to a place, unfortunately, called Kinko's and um, duplicated materials and sent them through what was called the mail, not email. <laughs> and um, we created a library of material. And we found that it was easier, finally, rather than to drag our own stories with us through life, to carry our stories, rather than to drag our own messages about what life is about, but to carry a message. And one of the things that um, has changed um, for, I would say somewhat negatively, is that, that there's been a, a dilution of the feminine in SAA. I think if you look at SAA as a whole, you would say that SAA does a good job of bringing recovery to men. Uh, I want to contrast one of the things that I see is that is that in Minneapolis, which is largely the metropolitan area of maybe Glasgow, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, there were in 1994, a thousand members of SA collectively, one third of whom were female. I can't imagine 300 women in all of UK and Europe you know, at this point. Um, and that's just what I'm talking about. Presently in the United States, 9% are female. And in the UK, of the people that show up, 1%. It takes two kinds of skin to take in the world. You know, it takes the tough skin and the soles of your feet that allow you to walk across a hot tar without burning if you move fast enough. And it takes the soft skin on your face to feel an infant's skin against your own. And I think that we're losing some of that influence by not having women in this room. Well, in this room is pretty good, but in a typical room, proportionate to the number of sufferers. When I'm talking about um, my Pony Express ride, what I'm talking about is that the message I want to impart is that it's to your advantage to do what you can in your own group or in other groups or in your life or in your 12-step work to carry the message so that it's safe for women to show up at meetings, that is safe for women to continue to recover that they have the sponsors they need. I, I um, 
recently received a message that there are five women in Israel who wanted to join the, the mixed group there and that they were challenged because the gay men would be sponsoring those women since there are no other, no other women available are tied up with sponsoring already. And so it struck me that from my very far distant view from the Middle East to the Middle West, that, um, that it seems like we may need to rearrange things that, that maybe some of the straight men can take on more of the sponsoring of, of gay men and let's free up gay men for the few women that you do have. Because I really think that there is a triage situation in the United Kingdom when it comes to the sponsoring of women. And that is 100% opinion. Um, I was thinking, you know, that what an opportunity, you know, that five women in that corner of the world want to join and they have no recovering among them, which is exactly the experience that I was in when I was with four other women who wanted to join the men's group and the men wouldn't have us, but we were in the same city. You know, um, it, it, it seemed to me that um, in Victorian days and earlier that when a woman entered the room and there was only one, a woman entered the room, there was only one seat, some gentleman would rise and she would be seated. In other words, there was an acknowledgement that some different presence was in the room and that presence needed to be accommodated, you know. Um, especially with the heavy clothing she had on it, <laughs> but, you know, that, that some things need to shift when there's, when there's a woman in the room, you know, that this is a program about sex. And if gender is obvious, there may be some adjustments that can be made and apparently could be made in order to bring the numbers up so that we are not just a fellowship that successfully causes, I mean, helps with recovery of men, but also helps with the recovery of women. And I, I know a person, a friend of mine in, in Seattle, who saw his mission as um, part of his ninth step for the women in his life whom he had, who, to whom he had owed um, amends to whom he could not make direct amends, made indirect amends by servicing the 12 step calls for women through whatever way was safe for him. That um, we want to make this safe for our daughters, my grandchildren, um, your nieces, your sisters. You know, that this is not just a good old boys club. And that is also marked 100% opinion, which I, which I get to do with white hair. <laughs> and um, so what is happening and these are some some notes of some styles of sponsoring are changing um, that there's not just one way of sponsoring and how do sponsors learn how to sponsor differently how do sponsors stay uh, charged how do they stay motivated I mean, I've been at it for 40 years. How do I do that? And that's by speaking to other sponsors. And to that end, Christine, who, who's over there in the little box on the, mm -hmm. <laughs> my little Hollywood square thing, is, um, has started a weekly um, sp sponsors helping sponsors group. And some of the topics that are available for that group involve take it, uh, discussions by sponsors on each of the steps, how they, how they sponsor other people, not just what the step is, but how they sponsor the 12 steps, um, cross-gender sponsoring, circles, boundaries, books and, books and resources, dating, dishonesty, helping healthy behaviors, dealing with new sponsees, prayer and meditation, relapse, singles, slogans, sponsor challenges, sponsee issues, sponsee sponsoring, sponsor concerns, sponsor support. 
I'm leaving, there's some others here too. I'm leaving that with you. That if you are a sponsor and are feeling a little burned out, there are resources for you to stay in, stay active, stay contributing, to, care, to ride your horse to the next town for the message. Um, there are other things that are happening. This is from a sponsee who's in Portland, Christina. And uh, Christina has said that one of the things that's really helpful in uh, retaining, recruiting um, women is orientation. You know, recognizing that you can't just drop into an SAA meeting if you're a woman with 45 men, and I've been in that position, and expect that what you know about 12 steps is gonna carry you through recovery in SAA. There are different memberships that are different individuals who come into orientation. Some of them have credits that transfer from other 12 step programs. Their orientation is easier than people come into this program and all their understanding of the 12 steps is what they learned in Hollywood. You know, sober up, apologize, convert, something like that. And so to modify that understanding of 12 steps to how it fits with their lives and what it means for them is best, uh, best uh, accomplished as far as what I understand about stable membership by having orientation meetings. And that's a question that I get across the board. And finally, somebody, rather than reinventing the wheel, somebody decided to start to nail down, you know, have podcasts about orientation that's starting. And that person needs help. That is Christine. And I will leave you her phone, I mean, her uh, contact information through, through Catherine. You know, so that when you have a newcomer and they want to know what, what's higher power, you know, is that some kind of electrical company and that, that you can plug them into podcasts on orientation, that there'd be, that you have, that'd be ideal that you have as a fellowship or as an intergroup, I don't know which, packets for newcomers, especially packets for women, um, and that you have some way of addressing um, a newcomer's reaction to uh, bottom line meetings. I wanna make a note that the bottom line um, notion of SAA meetings started in the 90s. It was not original. It came out of OA and the how movement of OA. It is not part of SAA itself. It has become handy for some people, it's become comfortable for some people, but it is terribly disconcerting if a woman does not know what the 12 steps are. One, does not know what sex addiction is. Two, and sure as hell doesn't know what recovery looks like. I went to one of those meetings and I thought if I were a newcomer, it would be not clear to me whether that person were practicing those behaviors or recovering. And if I had small children, I would think that it would not be safe for me to attend further and I would disappear. So that I think that those meetings are fine for those people, it helps, but to have a meeting that says mixed without that kind of a warning, I think can frighten off those people you want to attract. And attraction is the principle and I think bottom line is the personality. And there's a distinction. If it helps your own recovery, fine. But be aware that there is a red light as far as women in recovery. And that is their recovery and your recovery are linked. You have the same DNA. Um, there are study step and study groups for sponsorship. These can be workshops. They're going on in Portland. They can go on anywhere. And the act of writing literature is part of the 12-step recovery. I have a sponsee who isn't, is, feels uncomfortable doing sponsorship. She's married and her part, in, uh, part of her marriage involved the disclosure, uh, obvious disclosure to her spouse 
of her acting out behavior several years ago. What she is doing instead of sponsoring is um, encouraging her to write a pamphlet on disclosure of infidelity in recovery for those that that is appropriate. I mean, she cannot, it's not a ch choice for her. And when it's not a choice and she has to do it and her partner's not in recovery, what does that look like? And that's not a hypothetical, that's a real. And that's her message and only she can write. There is the women's intergroup. And if you don't know about it, there is the grace list in which um, is an international system where women can find sponsors. And that if you have a woman interested in seeking a sponsor, that you should know about that and how to get that. And I have some cards that I gave Catherine with that information on it too. That um, whenever you hear about a inter woman interested, she should be made aware of the grace list, which is international sponsoring. And if you are bilingual, trilingual, whatever, that is an assistance to um, women in recovery too, you know, so, so that um, if you are not willing to sponsor women, you may be able to write literature in whatever your other language is that could reach women. Um, other than that, I would be rattling on and I just want to say that um, I need your help that I have a satchel full of uh, messages that I've been carrying and I'm going to be passing that on. And my own message to you is that your stories are invaluable and you can take from this program, but it's at some point in imperative for your own recovery that you give back and that you give back, not monetarily, though I'm not discouraging that, Catherine, um, but that you give back by sharing your own story and reaching to the next person and the next generation, because you're part of this DNA. You're part of the heritage, especially in the city of Robert Louis Stevenson, who could not, for all the wonderful eloquence he had about suffering, know about recovery, but you do. You are his descendants and it's your message to carry. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Many thanks to Jeannie for allowing us to share this here on the podcast. I'm so grateful for that and grateful for the Puget Sound Retreat Committee for putting on such a wonderful retreat this past weekend. And like I had mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I did get permission to share a couple of the workshops and speaker recordings that happened at the retreat. Unfortunately, we did not record Deb W. speaking on behalf of COSA. And for anyone interested, W.W. was on episode number 20 of the podcast talking about intimacy and sexual avoidance. And it was really great to hear her story of recovery in the COSA program as well. The SAA speaker for the weekend was Nchatwa from the Bay Area. I will be sharing his talk on a future episode here. And last year's keynote speaker for SAA was Hayden. And after last year's retreat, I was really hoping to get her on the podcast earlier this year and finally got to do that recording this week. And we'll be sharing that probably on next week's episode. So yeah, a wonderful weekend of recovery. I think I'm going to keep this episode rather short. Yeah, it's been a really busy week here. In addition to recording an interview with Hayden, I also had the opportunity to record a segment for my friend's podcast. And he does a podcast on the TV show Stranger Things. And I've mentioned it here on the podcast before that the most recent episode of that podcast where I got to interview Wendy Dio, who is the widow of Ronnie James Dio, and talk about my love of metal. And it just so happens that the next episode of that podcast is talking about mental health and the use of music to help cope with life's problems. And if you've been listening to this podcast, you know that I have a deep, deep connection with music and recovery. 
And so I got to record a short segment for that podcast talking about my experiences of being in recovery and this recovery program and the podcast itself here. So in that segment, I got to talk about my relationship to music and recovery, working steps two and three in this program, and uh, doing this podcast, keeping everything pretty generic, just saying recovery (laughs) instead of sex addiction. Uh, But yeah, grateful for that opportunity to help carry the message of recovery through music. Anyway, don't have a lot of new emails this week. Most of the emails that have been coming in have been more for information about the podcast and not stuff to be read here as feedback. But if you are interested in leaving feedback for the podcast, you can reach us at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts rate and review us there. You can comment on the YouTube channel if you listen to episodes that way, and I'd be happy to read those on a future episode. And if you wanted to get a hold of me to be a future guest on the podcast or a panelist, or if you have any general questions about the podcast, you can reach me at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com, and I'd be happy to get back to you. So that is all that I have for this week. I'm so grateful that you tuned in for this one. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA. SAA.